with uh, Harkenstein Boiler, it's actually an insurance company. And I've been with the company about 25 years now. And prior to that, I was in the U.S. Navy on board several rooms, and I did that for about 10 years. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering for the Texas Mountain States, which includes Utah, and St. Louis, uh, Missouri, all that. And I'm the Director of Engineering for that, for that group. Uh, most of my time at Hartford, I actually spent in the field doing water inspections. Now, the water inspections I used to do were not the uh, heating water you see, but the big power water, the big utility boards at the um, power plants. You know, these things are like several stories tall, you know, 14 stories tall, something like that. And when we did an internal inspection of those, I mean, we were in there for a few days. I mean, we actually climbed inside these boilers and did the inspection. Now, one thing I noticed about doing these big power boilers, maybe because of the pressure of the high heat, but those man rays that you actually have to get into to climb into the boiler, after a couple of years, they start to shrink. <laughs> I was like, wow, last year I was able to get into this thing real easy. You know? Okay, so what do you call a boiler inspector who can't get into a boiler to do an inspection? Boiler operator? <laughs> Director of engineering. <laughs> so that's how I got my position. Okay, so not even sitting around the country while I'm safe. Talk about um, the boiler inspection process, you know, loss prevention activities. Um, it was real good to hear Jake up here talk about some of the um, electrical inspections because one of our largest exposures where we see most of our losses is on the electrical lamp, okay? And he's talking about infrared inspections and things like that. I mean, those are great tools to help minimize um, prevent electrical losses. Let's go ahead and get started here. So we're going to talk about what is a boiler, okay? Well, boiler's going to be anything that's going to be used to generate heat or heat up water or uh, generate steam, which is used for external to use. Uh, steam that's superheated, that's mainly for the um, big utility, the big process, industrial systems. Okay, talk about the basic types of boiler categories, all right? First of all, you've got your big power boilers. And these are going to be anything that have a uh, pressure rating of 15 p over 15 psi, all right? And I don't think you guys have anything on uh, any power boilers or anything like that. Now, some of the places you see the power boilers are like I said, in the industrial application, but sometimes even a uh, little small laundry, okay, the little steam um, process units they have back there are considered power boilers. The reason why we need to know the boiler category is because that dictates. Um, the frequency of the inspections. Okay. Uh, high temperature hot water boilers, that's mainly used for the industrial application. Uh, we don't see too many of those anymore. And of course, what you're mainly going to see here is the heating boilers. All right. Two basic types of boilers. We're going to have a water tube boiler and a fire tube. Now, the water tube boiler, just like it says, here inside the tubes of the boiler, we're going to have water. The water is going to rotate, or excuse me, it's going to, um, it's going to circulate between the two drums. They call it the steam drum and the mud drum, the other tubes. Once the water is heated inside these uh, tubes, generally um, you're going to be producing steam inside the steam drum. Now, there are some big water tube boilers that are used for hot water heating applications, but they're kind of few and far between. Mainly you're going to see a water tube boiler or a diesel side one like this, mainly going to be used in the uh, large, large industrial um, application. Typically what you'll see, here's a cleaver of Brooks. 
Now they are making some smaller water tube boilers for uh, heating application, but once again, these are very large facilities. This is that big uh, utility board that I was talking about earlier. You can kind of see how big these things are. And of course, we don't have anything like this here. But just to give you some reference, there, that's me right there with the board inspector down there. Okay? So you can see how tall, you know, tall these stories are. And the one thing I generally get upset about when I do an inspection of this is when the elevator's not working. <laughs> but yeah, but typically, you know, like I said, once again, Uh, there's a basic steam drum and mud drum, there's a circulating tube, and all these right here are basically tubes here, okay? Now these things here, these are fired with coal these days, pulverized coal. But just like I said, just to give you some scale as to what's really out there. And mainly what you guys are going to be dealing with are fire tube boilers. It's just the opposite of the water tube boilers. In this case, you're actually going to have the combustion, uh, products of combustion going inside the tubes. And the water, which is going to be heated for hot water or for steam, is going to be surrounding the boilers. So it's good to determine what type of boiler you have, fine tube or water tube. Now here's your basic, uh, what we call fine tube Scotch Marine boiler. There's your furnace right there, which is um, blowing out the products of combustion. It goes through what we call the main furnace tube, and then it bounces off the back walls and goes through the tubes themselves. So you got the hot, the hot gas is passing through the tubes, and the water is surrounding the tubes inside the shell. And then from that point, we're going to use that to produce either heat, uh, hot water, steam, or whatever. Now this is more in common than what you guys probably would see right here. This is a smaller fire tube scotch marine boiler. And this is typically what we see in uh, commercial and municipal type locations. This water here may be rated about what we call 100 horsepower. Typically, we're going to rate these uh, fire tube boilers what we call horsepower. And just for you know conversion factor, like one horsepower is equal to 34.5 pounds per hour of steam. Okay, what could possibly go wrong with your boiler? <laughs> a lot. Okay. First of all, let's take a look at some typical boiler failures. Okay. First of all, the major types of major causes of all boiler failures is going to be what we call low water condition. Okay. Next cause would be poor maintenance, which can lead to a low water condition. And then the other most common type of uh, cause of failure would be uh, what we call failure to control and safety devices. Now, what are some of the control and safety devices you have in the boiler? What do you think? Flow switch. Flow switch, okay. What's our last line of defense to keep that thing from blowing up or over pressure? Understand. Control. Pressure valve. Yeah, pressure relief valve, safety valve, and everything like that. Okay. I mean that safety valve. That's your last line of defense. Because we're going to see what can happen if you don't regularly check that safety valve. Okay. All right. Low water condition. Basically, what happens when you get a low water condition? Um, the boiler is, is, you know, is going along, you know, flying uh, back down and happy, but it calls for water and it doesn't get it. Uh, one, it doesn't call for water, and of course it never receives it. And once the water is allowed to boil dry, you can get a catastrophic failure of the boiler. So one, it's going to give you over temperature, it's going to overheat your boiler, and this can result in either cause extensive damage to the boiler, you know, melting of some of the tubes, or it can give you a catastrophic failure of the boiler. Now here's an example of what we call catastrophic, um, extensive damage. Remember that main furnace tube with, um, with the fire is going through? This is it right here. And they're not supposed to look like that. Right? <laughs> this happens when you basically boil the water dry, and that main furnace basically just starts to melt and separate from what we call the tube sheet here. All these little holes here are basically tubes, and you can kind of see the tubes there in the background, okay? In this case right here, you're going to have to replace the uh, the main furnace, you most likely may have to replace the uh, tube sheet. We're talking significant amount of damage here. And this will happen if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, this is what can happen, okay? The boiler can actually leave the boiler room, right? <laughs> when we do our inspections, we prefer that to do the inspections inside the boiler room, okay? That's the best place for it. Now this is an example of what we call catastrophic failure. 
Like I said, you get a low water condition, you know, you think you're building up a lot of pressure, you know, a lot of steam, okay? And once that water, you know, goes to atmospheric pressure, I think the way it expands is something like 16,000, you know, spaces to one, all right? So this thing can take off like a jet engine, okay? It can cause some serious damage along the way. So there may be some significant issues here. All right, poor maintenance, all right? Okay, this is a typical plug, what we call a uh, older type water tube boiler. And you can start to see it's starting to leak, all right? One thing about these leaks, okay, they don't stop, all right? Putting in some stop leak is not going to do it either, okay? You've got to leak, you've got to you you correct it, all right? Go ahead and correct it, it's just going to get worse. And if you start getting a leak, the leaks will start getting worse, you're going to start introducing more makeup water to the boiler. More oxygen is coming into the boiler, and more scale, and more deterioration of the boiler is going to occur. So if you got a leak, take care of it right away. Here's an example of more of this. I mean, this right here, this is kind of a poor design. This right here is actually the discharge pipe of a low water cutout device. <coughs> and a low water cutout device is basically designed to turn the boiler off if there's you know, low water condition. And we recommend every so often flushing that low water cutout device to prevent mud from building up in there. And they are doing that. So look at um, look at the discharge is coming right off on. Right this on is your gas, gas line, you know, yeah. so it's road up. This is like a power transformer right here, a control transformer. I mean, <coughs> that's why like wires here. Yeah, they are blowing it down, and we applaud them for that, okay? But let's see where we're blowing it down to. Okay. When you put the boiler back, make sure the people who are uh, disassembling and assembling the boiler have, know what they're doing. Okay. If you see anything wrong with this picture, and this is what we call a hand hole, all right? Basically, you take the hand hole off so you can get inside the boiler to either clean it or put in some type of inhibitors or whatever. But once a year, when we do an internal inspection, we basically look through these what we call these hand holes, and these have to be taken off. And once you take off this handle, there's a rubber gasket or some type of gasket that goes around it. But there's something wrong with this particular one when they put it back together. Something backwards. Huh? Mm -hmm. Kind of leaking. Kind of backwards. See this right here? That's supposed to be on the inside. It should be like that, okay? Uh-huh. Right now, are you getting much of a bite along this uh, connection bar right here? That's why this is supposed to go up and down and you have more of a uh, tighter connection on this. This thing is eventually going to leak on you. And you can see where it's supposed to be, okay? Where you know, the, the bar is supposed to be on this one. Okay, this is the inside of one of those fine two boilers, okay? Now, typically when we come in to do the inspection, we like to come in right after you take the boiler offline so that we can take a look and see what it looks like. Now, some, some inspectors like to take a look at it after you get it cleaned up. If that's the case, I would recommend saving some of the scale, you know, just so you can kind of see what kind of scale it's building up. Earlier, you know, uh, Jay talked about water chemistry, you know, popular makeup water, popular water chemistry, uh, having a good certified water tech come in there. You can always tell the sign of a really good water, um, uh, water company is do they come in when you disassemble your boiler for your inspection? Do they come in and take a look at the uh, water size of the boiler? Because if you're buying a lot of water chemicals, and you're getting a lot of scale like this, you know, they're just selling you chemicals, and that's that, that, you know, that going to be a job here. So in a good uh, scheme of good and bad, okay, this is, this is bad, right? <laughs> so what's wrong, with, what's wrong with the having the scale on there? What's bad about having a lot of scale? No transfer. Huh? No heat transfer. Yeah, it lowers the heat transfer. What does that result in? Higher utility costs. Higher utility costs.